Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I have a super special guest today, Alex Jameson. Alex is the best-selling author of Woman, Women, Food, and Desire, co-creator and co-star of the Oscar-nominated documentary, Super Size Me, and highly sought-after wellness expert for thousands. Alexandra Jameson has made it her mission to empower women to create epic lives by honoring their cravings and kicking body shame to the curb. Alex is the creator of Her Rules Radio, a number one rated podcast on iTunes, where listeners from around the world are educated and captivated by thought-provoking interviews on wellness, cravings, sexuality, and more. Her work has been praised and adored by Oprah, The Today Show, Dr. Oz, Goop, Martha Stewart Living, The New York Times, CNN, Fox News, Elle, Marie Claire, USA Today, People, and the American Heart Association, amongst them, many others. As a lifelong learner, her wellness expertise has grown out of a decade of experience, as well as her education at the Natural Gourmet Institute, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, and a certification in Applied Positive Psychology. Welcome, Alex, to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. Um, I have been listening to your podcast and, uh, yeah, I'm really, really enjoying the podcast. It's, it's excellent. That's, uh, what got me so excited about having you as a guest, even though you have many notable things to your credit, like helping with the documentary supersize me. How did that all come about? So I was starting culinary school and, 2000, 2001. And while I was going full time to school, I was serving drinks in a smoky bar, as you do in New York City, you know, total yin yang lifestyle, (laughs) healthy food all day, smoky bar all night. And one night at the bar, I saw this really cute guy standing there. So I picked him up. And we started dating. (laughs) And when I, the first night we met and I asked him, so what do you do? And he said, I'm a producer. I said, what is that? What, like, what, what does that mean? He said, I make things happen. I was like, oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I, but we started dating and his name was Morgan and I brought to the relationship, my passion for food. You know, I had grown up on an old organic farm, but I had gotten really sick Uh, in my early 20s and rediscovered food as a way to heal what was going on for me. And he brought to the relationship his passion for filmmaking. And we were sitting on his mom's couch on Thanksgiving Day 2002. And we had a conversation about uh, fast food and fast food culture and how it's marketed to children. And we came up with the idea for Super Size Me. He said, well, what would happen if I just ate McDonald's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner like they advertise it to children? And I was like, you'll get super sick. Please don't do that. But that was it. He was ready to do it. I said, fine, you're going to do this. I'm taking over after you eat all that crap for a month because I know what's going to happen. You're going to get so sick. And he did. If you've seen Super Size Me, you'll see me throughout the film tracking his progress and how sick he gets and how it impacts our relationship. And as soon as the movie was done, I took over and helped him heal again. Wow, that's pretty fantastic. And I mean, I imagine you didn't expect what I mean, how it took off like it did. I mean, that was crazy. We didn't expect any of it. It was interesting. He had three doctors and a nutritionist tracking his progress every week through the film. And all of them said, well, you might put on a few pounds, but the human body's super resilient. Probably not much is going to happen to you. But he put on 25 pounds in a month. His blood pressure went through the roof. His cholesterol went up 60 points in a month. 
and his liver was so filled with fat, he was giving himself non-alcoholic hepatitis. So all of his doctors were totally floored and we had no idea it was going to be that bad. So we didn't know filming this, what was going to happen. We were shocked and amazed when it got into Sundance and then it got picked up. We traveled to over 25 countries that year premiering the film around the world because it was like the right conversation at the time, you know, fast food culture from America spread around the globe. Countries around the world were starting to see the obesity crisis hit their countries. And it, here was this little funny, educated and entertaining film that addressed all the issues people are seeing around the world. So it really hit all those sweet spots at this incredible moment. Well, and then fast forwarding, put me in your shoes when you get the call to be on Oprah. What was that like? Yeah, that was pretty wild. Um, you know, we, we got nominated for an Oscar. We got to go walk the red carpet. We got to go to the Vanity Fair Oscar party afterwards, which is like every cover of People magazine you've ever seen come to life in one room. So oh, amazing. Yeah. I got to meet Eddie Izzard. I was so excited about that. <laughs> Um, but actually we, we didn't go on Oprah for super size me after super size me, we made a, a show based on the same premise called 30 days. And in 30 days, a different person would, it was kind of like a reality show, but a documentary style reality show where a person would go into another life for a month to experience a different social issue. So Morgan and I went to Columbus, Ohio, and we lived on minimum wage for a month and we got minimum wage jobs. We were both working two jobs. And again, it was really um, timely and topical. Different states around the country were talking about raising the minimum wage. And, you know, we both got really sick that month. He injured his arm and I got a bladder infection ugh, of all things. And between those two visits to the emergency room, we were totally wiped out in one month. And this was another aspect of health that we didn't cover and supersize me, but it was also the challenge of eating well on a minimum wage budget is, you know, oh, additionally yeah. challenging. We ate a lot of that. rice and beans. We ate a lot of brown rice and beans with <laughs> different spice profiles, <laughs> but we got to go, we got to go on Oprah for, for that show talking about minimum wage and, how it's affecting people around the country. Wow. So that was your go-to, the brown rice and beans and that. And what else did you buy then? I'm sure there's a lot of people out there listening that may want to know, how can I eat healthy without spending my whole paycheck? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, I did go to culinary school, so I had a basis in whole foods cooking. And I remember getting on the bus and, you know, this was an additional challenge. You know, if you have minimum, if you're on a minimum wage job, you might not have a car or you might not be able to drive where you need to go to get cheap food. So I took a bus across town to the health food store where they sell things in bulk. So I went and I bought like a big bag of lentils and a big bag of brown rice and quinoa and black beans and just like all these basics so that we could use that as the, the foundation for every meal, right? Like breakfast was brown rice with cinnamon and raisins, you know, and buying in bulk was really the, that's really the cheapest way to get a lot of calories for your diet in a healthy way. Awesome. Awesome. Well, kind of taking what you said about here you were, you're at the height of, you know, pretty much, everything. I mean, being on Oprah is a big deal. And, you know, Dr. Oz, you've been on all these shows and you, you're living this life kind of hobnobbing with the rich and famous, so to speak, and traveling. You're in New York City. Um, you, you were, you know, just a little background. You were a vegan. You're, you know, all of these things. And it just all came crashing down can you tell us about that story? Because I really want to help empower women out there. And that's what this message is all about. Yeah, sure. 
So I was vegan for over a decade. Um, Morgan and I got married a couple of years after Super Size Me. We were pregnant with a baby and, um, you know, life got very fast. He, his fame took off. I got pregnant. I was just starting my health coaching practice as a coach and consultant. And, you know, a, a, a famous spouse brings with it a lot of cool stuff and it brings with it a lot of challenges. And by the time my son was about a year and a half old, our marriage was falling apart. Um, there was some infidelity happening. He wasn't around much and we tried counseling for several months and nothing was happening. Nothing was moving. And so we separated and I, I realize now looking back, you know, nine years ago, I realized now I went into a real depression. Um, I, I hadn't been working for a couple of years because I took time off to raise our son as an infant and was just starting to get back into writing. I had written two books at this point, The Great American Detox about Super Size Me, and then a couple of dummies books, Living Vegan for Dummies and Vegan Cooking for Dummies. But my business as a health coach was really stagnant. Nothing was happening. And my health started to really fail. You know, this was a whole different set of issues from what I had experienced in my mid twenties. My mid twenties, I was really, I had overblown candida yeast issues, full body, migraine headaches, almost every day, exhaustion, depression. But as soon as I changed how I was eating, went vegan, whole foods, cut out sugar, etc. Like within a couple of weeks, I started to feel amazing, but this was different. I was chronically anemic. Like I could not get enough plant-based iron into my body. It just wasn't working. My hormones were tanking, right? Because as soon as one aspect of your mineral levels gets off, it affects everything else. So I started to, to develop insomnia almost every night. And once you have insomnia, even one or two nights in a row, you start to go into insulin resistance that was affecting my thyroid. So oh, I yeah. just, I just started to spin down and I tried everything in the vegan framework to fix it, but nothing was working. And I struggled with this for about a year. And again, I was depressed and a single mom and exhausted with a toddler. So there was a lot happening. And I started craving meat. This was not good. This was not on brand. None of these things were in your plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was known as the famous <laughs> vegan chef girlfriend from Super Size Me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Right? And Our identities, right? Yeah, it really was my identity. And a lot of my community, not only people that followed me online, read my newsletter, but a lot of my friends were vegan or animal rights activists. And I, I said, you know what, I teach people as a health coach, to listen to their bodies to have compassion for themselves, so that they can heal, right? It's not just about what we eat. It's about how we feel about ourselves, how we treat ourselves. And I was not, a, I was not listening to my body. Like I was literally salivating in the restaurant when I would see people eating salmon or steak. Well, here I am with another tofu salad. And I thought, gosh, you know, I've got, I have to try this because nothing else is working. And I'm, I was suffering. And I secretly started eating animal protein again. And when I say secretly, I mean, like I would go to the co-op and put salmon and eggs under my kale in the basket. So nobody would see it. And I would like furtively look around and make sure nobody I knew was there. I would go home and like draw the blinds and eat alone. I mean, so I was like really developing this disordered way of eating. I was now freaked out about eating the wrong thing. But it makes sense to me though. <laughs> But physically, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had to, I was like, I got to get over this and try it. And if it doesn't work fine, but physically I started feeling better right away and I just needed that foundation. And what I've discovered is that the diet that heals you isn't always the diet that will sustain you. 
So the vegan diet that helped me heal in my mid twenties, now in my mid thirties was not serving me anymore. But I secretly ate like this for about a year and I stopped calling myself vegan. I stopped talking about vegan. I was only like, oh, here's a plant-based recipe if you want to try it. But I felt this shame and this worry. Like I am trying, I, I have to be authentic in myself if I'm going to be out there and help people be true to who they are. So I finally wrote this yeah. blog post. Oh, I can relate to that. Yeah. I finally wrote this blog post and I remember with fear finally pushing send <laughs> and it was called I'm not vegan anymore and I sent it out as a newsletter and went to bed and I was like all right I'll just start over tomorrow and the next morning I woke up and there were thousands of shares thousands of comments it went viral but this was not a case of me wanting something to go viral. Like I did not want everyone <laughs> to talk about this, but they, I got hundreds of emails personally to my inbox. Some of them very angry. Most of them were vicious. Some of them were like death threat emails because I was now a traitor to the vegan cause. Oh my and God. People wanted me dead. And it was wow. horrible. That was it was hard. It was so hard, but it made me realize this is why women have such a hard time changing how they eat or relating to their bodies, understanding how they feel because we are so afraid of the judgment and the vicious shaming that happens. You know, the and it can be on such a small scale. It can be joking, it can be teasing. But we, it's so much pressure and energy that we don't want. We're just trying to figure ourselves out. So changing how we eat in public is so scary for us. Well, I know it had to take a lot of courage for you as a vegan, a famous vegan with a vegan following to put it out there that, you know, I now eat meat. And then this whole chain of events happened you know because of it but I, I also kind of see the empowerment in in that and standing in your truth in putting it out there that you now eat meat um and also just the whole everything that has come from everything you've went through like here you are you're you're married to Morgan. You guys have created the Super Size Me documentary. You created the other thing with the, you know, minimum wage jobs. You've, you've got this whole life and identity built around that. And, and, uh, and it came crashing down. So you had to do a lot beyond just what we're talking about, diet and all that. You had to do some deep soul searching, like in, within yourself, to find this woman that you are today, which is a woman that is helping other women not to minimize themselves. And, you know, I could, when I w listen to your podcast, I just so related to the whole minimize me podcast that you had, where you're talking about how, you know, we minimize ourselves in so many ways, like, you know, somebody, you know, maybe we're shining our light and, and somebody doesn't feel comfortable with us shining our light. So we shrink. How can we stop shrinking and start just stepping fully into our personal power as women? Mm, I'm so glad you brought that up. It is, it's not something we can do alone. Um, you know, I mentioned that I had a lot of friends who were vegan and who were animal rights activists and, I lost a lot of friends that day. They, they would have nothing to do with me. They considered me a traitor. And luckily I have always felt 100% supported by my family, my mom, my dad, my brother, my, you know, even my extended family. Like I've never questioned their belief in me and, you know, their trust in me. They never teased me about my diet. You know, they were only ever supportive when I became vegan. So I knew that they would be supportive when I was no longer vegan, you know? So I had that foundation. I know not everybody has that. 
but everyone has one person who believes in them and supports them. And even though I lost a lot of friends in that experience, I knew I still had friends who were going to love me no matter what. And it was a couple of girlfriends and I had actually just started dating again. And actually I just a year and a half ago married Bob, the guy that I was dating when all this was going down. And he was like, I don't care what you eat. Like, seriously, bacon, not bacon, whatever you want. <laughs> so it was, it was a few people who I could be honest with before I made this declaration. I knew, you know, these people have got my back. And even if I lose my whole business, which by the way, I pretty much did, like I lost half of my newsletter list in a week. And that's, oh my gosh, that's yeah. your business. Wow. As, a, yes. you know, as an online coach, that was scary, but yeah, but I that knew, took courage. I, you know, we've all been through traumas and everyone can point to an experience in your life where you have been through something so horrible. You thought I, I never thought I would make it through and you did. If you built something once, you can build it again. And I have this very low tolerance for inauthenticity in my life. So if I feel out of alignment, doesn't my business isn't going to work. If I feel out of alignment with the people that I'm hanging out with, I'm like, wow, I don't feel like I really resonate with these people. Or I don't feel like I can trust them then those relationships are not worth investing in. And I think I've just gotten used to, it's not, it's not easy at first. It's, it's never easy to let go of people or to let go of a way of being. But the more you do it, the, the easier it becomes. You, believe, you, you develop grit and resilience. And that's part of why I went back and did this whole positive psychology training a few years ago. Because I was like, I, I know I have some of that, but I know it's a muscle that you can develop and strengthen. How can I help other people strengthen that? So positive psychology has become a huge toolbox in my work. I love that. I know a lot of us stand back in fear. How do we move from being afraid? I think sometimes you feel beat down, like when you are yourself, society wants you to be, or, you know, your spouse or your parents or your friends want you to be a certain person. And, you know, how do you get out of that fear of feeling like you have to live this life everybody's expecting of you to live in your authenticity of who you really are? Um, I've, I've lived that inauthentic life and anyone watching this and, and you as well, you've been in yeah. that place in your life, in a relationship or in a job or in a way of living where you're like, this doesn't work for me. And you have to get really serious. Like this is my one life. If I look forward 50 years from now, if I look forward five years from now and nothing has changed, how, how will that be for me? Like you have to get super deadly life and death serious about, is this okay? Will I look back on my deathbed and be satisfied or, or no, no. I won't be, I've got to try. I've got to try something else. I've got to have boundaries. I've got to take a stand for what I believe in. I have to put my ideas out there. And I, in the, right as I was writing women, food and desire, my mom and one of my best friends got diagnosed with, and then both died very quickly from cancer. So just as I was writing this book that came out of the whole, coming out is no longer vegan thing. Women, food and desire was in it. My mom and my best friend both passed very quickly. And it was such, it was such a, a huge loss, not just to me, but to the world. These two women were remarkable. They were both libraries of experience and wisdom and they were gone too soon. 
And, you know, I, you know, maybe people listening like me have lost someone where you're like, wow, like they had so much left to give so much left to do. I don't want to be that person that, doesn't like wring out every ounce of juiciness from life, you know, before it's all gone. Yeah. I love that answer. That's perfect. Yep. Live every day, you know, like to the fullest. So you don't regret the time, right? Cause it's going to pass anyway. And it doesn't mean you yeah. have to, it doesn't mean you have to move faster and work harder necessarily. Sometimes that's appropriate. But it's also about slowing down and getting really present and learning how to be in the moment and drink up and savor what you've got. You know, I'm actually, I'm actually on a, a week long retreat right now with my son who's 11. And we're just staying upstate New York at a friend's house on a lake. And it is the sweetest time of my life. And it's not super exciting. <laughs> We're just walking down to the lake a few times a day and cooking and watercoloring. And But I am so clear that this is the most important thing I could be doing with my life right now. And how much how much do we really get present into each moment and experience what we have, including food, including our workouts? You know, are you, are you rushing through everything you do and not really being there and really enjoying it? It's a great skill to develop. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just getting clear and getting that clarity from slowing down or having some play time, or blue sky time, you know, like Todd Durkin says, it's just having that time. It's what rejuvenates you. And you can't give to others if you don't fill up your cup. And uh, I, I, I'm finding a lot of women out there have, you know, they don't, they're having these cravings, they're having these cravings. Um, and they, you know, maybe it's chocolate, maybe it's, you know, it's showing up in all sorts of ways. But what are they really craving? Are they craving that blue sky time? Are they craving more connection? How, how do we tap in to our desires and figure out what our cravings really mean? So in my book, Women, Food and Desire, I go into the four root causes of cravings. And some of them are super nuts and bolts. And some of them are like, whoa, big life question. <laughs> But the four root causes are bacterial, nutritional, emotional, and physical. So any craving that you're having could be one or more of these things. So bacterial, like really on a biochemical level, on a microscopic level, we are as much bacterial as we are human. We have yeasts and bacteria that live in our bodies. We have a symbiotic relationship with them, right? A lot of them are in our gut, in our digestive digestive system, and they actually help us digest and absorb nutrients from our body. They help us communicate with our nervous system. Like they are amazing and they do so much for us. But if you're like me in my mid twenties and you're living a super stressful lifestyle, eating a highly acidic refined diet, that bacterial balance can get wonky and you might develop like I did candida, candida, or, um, bacterial dysbiosis, and those bacteria crave different things. The candida yeast, which many people are walking around suffering from, brain fog, skin outbreaks, digestive trouble, bloating, you know, massive sugar cravings, those are all candida symptoms. Those candida yeast crave sugar. They live on sugar that you eat. So if you've ever tried to go off sugar and you feel like you're dying, like, oh, you feel like the flu, like headachey, and it's like this overwhelming urge for sugar, it's because the candida in your body is dying and it's saying, go to the freezer and get some Ben and Jerry's, <laughs> feed me. It is. They literally communicate with our nervous system through the vagus nerve. 
So the bacteria in your body have got to be in balance. So if you're experiencing those imbalanced symptoms, that's where you got to start. You're totally also- preaching to the choir on that one. <laughs> yeah. I completely relate. I had the same symptoms. It was ridiculous. Um, and I, you know, did uh, a lot of, I went to a holistic doctor and that's where I found out what was going on. I was exposed to toxic mold. I had, you know, these candida symptoms and that's how I actually started into taking probiotics and my favorite brand is the, is the sponsor of the show, Dr. O'Hara's Probiotics. I mean, totally, they rock. And the reason why I use that brand is because they completely, are, they helped you to develop your own good flora and not all good, not all probiotics do that. So that's why I use Dr. O'Hara's. That's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad. Yeah. I mean, even psychologists and psychiatrists are starting to prescribe probiotics for people because we actually need a healthy, balanced microbiome for yeah. a for good mood, for good mental health as well. So it's like the wild west of nutrition out there with the probiotics, I tell it's you. It's crazy because it's your second brain. And it's like, we're all your emotions. And I I mean, I thought, I think it's fascinating. Like you're, you know, the whole thing, trust your gut. I mean, (laughs) I think it's all related because your gut influences so much of your mood and your feelings and just so much. So I'm so with you on that. It's true. And And there's also nutritional cravings and know your body, like, my craving for meat was directly related to my hormonal imbalance and my low iron levels. You know, my body was craving what it needed in that way. And sometimes people will crave chocolate, right? Women especially will crave chocolate at certain points in their menstrual cycle. Well, chocolate actually happens to be one of the best sources of dietary magnesium. And most women are magnesium deficient and their body knows your body is really brilliant and wise. And she knows your body that she can get magnesium as well as fat and sugar and all that deliciousness in chocolate (laughs) that she needs. So she's not wrong in asking for chocolate. She's trying to get what she needs in the most delicious way possible. So if you can look at it in that way, more of a curious, like, oh, that's why I'm craving chocolate. And many of my clients, I put them on magnesium supplements and their chocoholicism goes way down. So there's those nutritional kinds of cravings as well. And then there's the realm that always gets shut out of dietary theory, which is such a shame. And that's the emotional cravings and the physical yeah. cravings. You know, we are emotional creatures. Don't let anybody try to tell you that you're too emotional because it's BS. We're all emotional creatures. Look, my husband works as a consultant in like fortune 50 companies. He goes into boardrooms and works in some of the most masculine places you can think of some of the most high powered people in the world. And he's like, he tells me how they operate. I'm like, there is so much emotional posturing going on. He's like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Don't think that because it's mostly men and it's a very masculine setting that it's not emotional. It totally is. So the fact that women especially are told that we're too much, we're too emotional, blah, blah, blah. It's BS. And people come to me and they say, Alex, I have an emotional eating problem. And I say, sweetheart, welcome to the human race. We are all emotional eaters. All of us. You can't separate emotion from food. I always say that Food is the most intimate thing we do with other people in public. It's how we show love. It's how we comfort ourselves. It's how we deal with stress. It's how we deal with anger. It's sometimes how we inflict anger on ourselves. So you're not wrong for having that. The the opportunity in emotional eating is to find real healing for your whole life. But again, that requires a lot of support and some time. And then there's the really fun stuff, the physical cravings. 
probably have never talked to anybody about this before, but we're going to talk about sex and food now. Are you cool with that? All right. Now we're cooking. (laughs) (laughs) So you were mentioning play earlier, blue sky time. Um, I always say that vitamin P is like the, the thing that we're all lacking. And that is playful movement, play in our bodies and in our minds and pleasure. We humans are pleasure seeking machines, right? All of our habits are searches for dopamine and oxytocin, right? Everything you do that gets you excited, whether it's eating or playing sugar candy crush on your phone or going on Twitter or gambling or shopping, those are all ways that you seek dopamine. Your brain gets a dopamine hit and it goes bing. And it makes your brain all happy. So we are just pleasure seeking machines for sure. (laughs) And most of us feel very tied up in knots about sex and sexuality and sexual expression and curiosity and physical pleasure in general is very taboo in our current culture. It's especially for women, but definitely for men also. You know, we're walking on a razor's yeah, edge. I don't, th- yeah, I don't think it's just women. There are it's men not just too. women. Yeah. And there's no yeah. way to, there's no safe place to talk about it. And the messages we're given by our parents or by whatever religion we're brought up in tells us that sex is bad and it's, it's only okay in these certain circumstances and these certain expressions. And we just get tied up in knots around it. So for women, Sex is so dangerous for us. Not only are we are, are so many women victims of rape and sexual abuse as we as we grow up, but we're told to be pretty but not too sexy. We're told to be beautiful, you're, but only a certain kind of beautiful. Uh, we're told oh to gosh, be totally. welcoming and accommodating, but not too pushy. We're to, you know it's like we're always freaking walking this tightrope of what's appropriate for women. So sex is just dangerous. It's so fraught. So food becomes our safe sex. It becomes our only form of real physical pleasure that we're allowed to do in public anytime, anywhere. And it's super cheap, right? Wow. That is, oh my gosh, that is like so right on. So we, we are naturally pleasure cravers. Right again, don't forget that dopamine hit that we get every time we watch reality TV or any of the hundred things we do a day to feel some kind of pleasure. You're not wrong for seeking pleasure, but are your food cravings really your body's search, your body's request for fun, for sexual expression, for sexual pleasure, for connection? And the, you know, the book really dives into this. Wow. I love that. I, I think everyone's going to run out today and get a copy. And I, I got I have to say, I am enjoying the book. The book is, it just deals with so many things beyond food. And I just think that that is the, the ticket. Like what we're talking about is what's really going on inside of you. That's, you know, you're not taking care of you know, like she said, save sex with food. I never thought of it that way, but whoa, that is so deep. That is so right on. (laughs) I'm glad you agree. (laughs) Yeah. And, and by the way, if, if people's ears are perking up about this last one, especially just skip directly to chapter eight in the book. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I I mean, that's probably going to get, be a worn out (laughs) I have a lot of chocolate cravers out there that are probably watching the podcast and uh, now their secret is up. They know what they're truly, what they're truly craving. They're either craving magnesium or they're craving chapter eight. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Well, the, um, the book itself, how did you, come up with the idea for women desiring food. Tell me about that. So the book was actually totally inspired by the huge backlash against 
my coming out is no longer vegan. And it got so much attention in such a short period of time. Again, you know, it went viral. It was everywhere on Facebook. And I was actually approached by a, a new literary agent who said, I think there's something here. This is getting so much attention. People can't stop talking about what's going on with you. And it goes so deep and so broad. So we sat down and I worked up a book proposal just based on, you know, I, I've been working with women as a health coach for 16 years. And I, I've seen these trends I've seen these habits and these dots being connected between what women want their weight their food behavior uh you know women's empowerment you know they're all connected and then the public shaming and you know there's just it's not a, a simple you know three-step process it's really examining our whole lives and our whole culture around food and sex and what it is to be a woman so it was just the thing that i was so scared of to come out and say what was going on for me and then the the overwhelming amount of attention that it got ended up leading directly to creating this book and I could not, I had no idea that was going to happen. That was not my intention. My intention was to just get clear and be honest and be like, this is what's true for me. So that's another good example for your listeners. You know, if you're afraid to step out and make a stand, to share your truth, to make a statement, you have no idea where it might lead it ended up leading to this incredible project to write this book. And I'm so grateful for that. And it, it led to me speaking to you today. If I wouldn't have started and stepped out in my purpose and what I feel I'm supposed to do, which is to really help women to just own their authenticity and step into their personal power and not ask permission to be themselves. And so SWEAT stands for Strong Women, Empowering, Achieving Together. And I'm just all about that whole women building each other up and just having each other's backs and uh, being in a community of women, building that, because that is where we truly, truly rock and step into our greatness is just surrounding ourselves with other women that bring out the best in us. It's absolutely yeah. true. I could not do this without the women in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Finding, finding those people that do support you, I think is, is huge. Right. And, and step in for you to be able to do everything that you've done, you have to have some type of a support system and uh, how do women build that support system? How do they, um, what is, what are some tips that you would tell them today? Um, you know, there actually are a couple of amazing in-person events. You know, I could talk about, you know, go to your local yoga studio, or if you're interested in taking a dance class, you should totally just take a dance class and see who else is there. You know, who, who lights you up? who are you attracted to? It's not about dating. It's like, Oh, like that person's really cool. Or I like what she said, or she looks nice. You know, something in me is telling me to ask her out if she wants to go to tea, you know, just being, how were you? How did you make friends when you were a kid? Give that a shot. But it's really challenging uh, as adults because we aren't surrounded by so many people like we were growing up, you know, as children, and you have to put yourself intentionally in communities of like-minded people. So there's actually two summer camps for adults that I highly recommend you check out. <laughs> I love that. I used to go to summer camp when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. So they're both filled with incredible people who would watch or listen to either of our shows. Um, one is Jonathan Fields Good Life Camp. And the other is called Soul Camp, run by two women that I know, um, Allie and Michelle. Um, a couple of them are here uh, on the East Coast. One happens in California. So check out Soul Camp and Good Life Camp. You know, there are places where you can go away with like-minded people that are healthy. You know, it's all about like 
fun activity, dance classes, exercise, great food, being outdoors, but also really connecting with people around the topics that you're curious about, you know, positive psychology, spirituality, yoga, etc. Like go invest in yourself, take a risk and go someplace that you're pulled to go experience, go on a retreat, go work with a coach, like take a leap. If you feel drawn to something, some experience, other people like you will be there too. That's really great. That's really great. One of the things that I have been thinking about when I listen to some of your, your podcasts is how much trouble women have stepping out into their purpose or what it is they feel that they should be doing. Um, and, and just being empowered, they feel like they have to ask permission um, because you know how we were talking about that glass ceiling earlier where women feel like they have to be a certain way. They have to, you know, be in between this or between and how, how do women stop asking permission to start living their greatest lives? So I'm going to give you an answer that no one's expecting. (laughs) Um, I can't wait to hear it. You have to start listening to your body. And this is what my work has been about for years. It's what women food and desire is about. We have to get into a relationship with our bodies of trust And to build a relationship with your body where you feel what your body needs, you feel your truth, you hear your gut instinct and you listen to it and you trust it, you have to start asking yourself, what do I want now? What choice should I make? What does this craving really mean? What do I need to be healthy and whole and strong right now? You have to ask yourself that question and you have to listen And you have to follow what you hear. You can't just listen to your body. You can't just ask, what do I need right now? And then hear the answer and say, no, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Right? That's like we get into this weird, like abusive relationship with ourselves where we start to ask what we need, what we want, and then we ignore it. And we say, no, that's not a good idea. No, you don't, you know, that's not, that's never going to work. If you were in a relationship where somebody asked you what you wanted and then they ignored you repeatedly and did the exact opposite for years, that's a horrible relationship, right? You wouldn't want to be in that relationship. Right. Absolutely. No way. (laughs) You want out. So, so if you want power, if you want to feel trusting, if you want to know yourself and love who you are, you've got to ask you, you've got to ask your body and soul, what is my truth? What is it that I need? And then you got to go for it. You got to trust, you got to leap and follow what you hear, even if it means making mistakes, you know, as you make mistakes, you learn. That's one of the things that I studied in positive psychology so much was mistakes are not a, they're not the end. It's just like, Oh, that didn't work. How do I get to the next? What do I do next? What's the next thing I could try? I know this seems like um, an old example that we've all heard a million times, but Thomas Edison, it took him, hundreds, if not thousands of tries of different materials and different designs to create the incandescent light bulb. And he said, it's not that I made 999 mistakes to get to the one that worked. I found 999 ways to not make a light bulb. And he was right. We have to be willing. Like my life is so important. I have to be willing to risk doing what I think is the right thing. I love that. That is awesome. I just want to acknowledge you so much for just how beautiful your, your soul and your spirit shine, because I can just see how you are completely 100% your authentic, than self. Like you're just 
so in tune with what it is you're talking about in your book. And I just want to acknowledge you so much for everything that you have been through and how you've come out of it resilient with grit and helping other women to own their personal power. Thank you. You know, I, I, I feel the same about you and I feel the same about, honestly, I feel the same about every woman I meet. Don't you see that in them? Every woman you meet, like you see the, the potential, her possibility, that fire, that spark in her. You know, I've talked to so many women over the years who feel broken. They're like, fix me. I'm like, I don't think you're broken. You have everything you need in you. We're all that way. And when you start asking your body what she needs and you start following through on what she tells you, you will start to feel that way about yourself. I promise. Oh my gosh. I love that. That brought, that made my eyes sting. (laughs) Um, And I do look at my clients. I, I tell them all the time. I see the potential. I see where you're going to be. I see that that's how I see them, the potential. Yeah. And yeah. we all have that potential within. And uh, I, w- I've just so enjoyed talking to you and sharing with you and just thank you so much for spending this time with us. Mm. Where can people reach you on social media and get oh. more of you and get your book? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Got to go get the book. (laughs) Well, you can get the book on Amazon for sure. If you love a paper book to hold in your hand, or if you want to get the book for free and you've never joined audible, if you love audio books, you want to try it, you can go to audibletrial.com forward slash crave cast C R A V E C A S T. So audibletrial.com forward slash crave cast. And you can download me reading women, food and desire to you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this is a question I didn't tell you about, but I always ask it. And it's my last one. What are three simple truths you can leave with the audience today? Three simple truths. Uh, Nature is medicine. Uh, songwriters are poets and no one should eat high fructose corn syrup. (laughs) (laughs) I have very few food rules that like apply to everyone, but that's the one. (laughs) Oh my God. I have to laugh because I was calling it fructose. No. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like that it's the F word. It is. It's the F word. Oh my God. Well, thank you so much. And thanks everybody for listening to the Sisterhood of Sweat. Thanks for having me.